So that was really fantastic to follow Matthew. And I just want to be like, hallelujah. I'm glad people like that with brains like that are thinking about topics like these. And I wasn't going to talk a whole lot about reproductive technologies today, but now I'm going to have to. So buckle up. Uh, we're going to do it all. Um, I, uh, 10 years ago, wasn't really doing any of this. I was just a stay-at-home mom. I had four kids. We had just come home from China after adopting our youngest child. Um, and people will say, like, why are you doing this? And the short answer is the left broke me. Like, they broke me. They went so nuts so fast on so many of these topics that I think what it did is it enlisted all of us ordinary lay people, right, that we suddenly went, uh, you're doing what? Kids don't need moms and dads. Men can become women. What, what is going on? Um, and suddenly, a lot of us decided, I guess now we have to get involved. Right? And you probably feel some of that too. Um, maybe vocationally, you're not a professional, you're not a bioethicist, maybe you're not even a pastor, right? You're just an accountant or a market, you know, working in marketing. Well, guess what? It's your fight, right? So something about what you're learning here this week, God's gonna want you to do something specific with that. Um, and I think that that's kind of how this war is gonna get won is through ordinary people, ordinary moms and dads, just saying, I'm not gonna cross this line. I'm not gonna let you cross this line either. So that's kind of why I'm here. Um, my husband's a pastor in Seattle. Um, I'm talking to all you guys in Tennessee and I'm like, hey, how's my church doing here? Because everybody has left Seattle. I call it the, uh, the exodus, right? It's not through the Red Sea, it's to the Red States. Um, and so enjoy, enjoy. Your real estate prices are still better than ours. So I'm not bitter. Um, but my husband's a pastor. He is kind of like Matthew, like they both sort of live in the philosophical and the theoretical. And I really appreciate that. I just don't think that way, right? I think in the practical and in the application. So I'm not gonna give you tons of scripture here. I trust you already know a lot of the scripture. I'm gonna talk about the practical application of the scripture when it comes to the social science and sort of the natural law, the so what side of the argument. So um, I wanna first, I'm, what we do at them before us, them, the children before us, the adults, is we look at every marriage and family issue through the lens of what about the kid? We want to center the conversation about every marriage and family issue, whether it is the definition of marriage or divorce or cohabitation or polygamy or surrogacy or adoption or sperm and egg donation or same-sex parenting or transgender parenting or whatever it is, first on elevating a child's right to be known and loved by their mother and father. So that's what we're gonna focus on during this conversation today. But I wanna start with scripture, since this is a Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod conference, and I know you guys are fans of the scripture. So we're gonna start with the scripture. Um, and we're gonna start with a very, very well-known passage of scripture, Matthew 19, where Jesus gives us the definition of marriage. I'm going to read this, and I'm going to read this to you the way I read it to my kids, where I expect them to complete the end of the sentence, right? This is sort of like the little Baptist Bible quiz before bedtime. Um, so Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them? Mm -hmm. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his and hold fast to his, and the two shall become, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, okay, nicely done. You guys all get 1,000 LCMS points. Good job. Um, so what's interesting about this very, very brief definition of marriage that Jesus gives is that it actually reflects the four norms of marriage that set marriage apart from any other relationship in the pantheon of human relationships. And if Ryan Anderson were here, which I think you guys had him last year, right? He outlined, uh, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called What is Marriage with Sharif Girgis and, and uh, Robert George, where they contrasted two different versions of marriage, the consent-based view, which is like, if it's consensual, it's a marriage, right? And they laid out the conjugal view of marriage that had four specific distinct norms that set this relationship apart from other human relationships. And so those four norms can actually all be observed 
in this one definition that Jesus gave for marriage. So the first one is, this is a very gendered definition of marriage, right? Three different times. He says, man, woman, uh, sorry, male and female, uh, father, mother, husband, wife. Okay, so he gives a very gendered definition of marriage. So this is what we call in the marriage work world complementarity, right? This is the norm of complementarity. Marriage is going to involve a relationship between two different things that complement one another, male and female. So it also says that the two, the two are going to become one flesh. So the two points to another norm of marriage, which is exclusivity. This is to be an exclusive union, right? Forsaking all others. This is an exclusive union. So then it says, the two shall become one flesh, one flesh. So this is where we get monogamous from, right? Monogamous, married to one, they become one flesh. And then what God has joined together, let no man separate. So that is the norm of permanence. This is supposed to be a lifelong union. So Ryan Anderson um, and the What is Marriage book lays out these four norms of marriage. And the way that they would put the complementarity aspect is a special link to children, right? So that's sort of Ryan T. Anderson speak for um, complementarity. There's a special link to children. You can only have that special link to children if you have the complementary halves of humanity involved in that union. So now we're going to play this game, this complete the end of the sentence scripture game with something that may not as be well known. And so the people that get this one right get 5,000 LCMS points. Okay, are you ready? This is from Malachi chapter two. It says, did he not make them one? Who said it? Raise your hand if you said it. Don't be shy. Mm, adorable girl with the great green dress in the back. Oh, okay, good job. Um, with a portion of the spirit in their union. And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. Raise your hand if you got godly offspring. 5,000 points. Okay, good job. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Okay, so what we see is God actually has a purpose for marriage beyond just adult fulfillment, okay? And he lays it very explicitly, says it very explicitly in Malachi, where he says, God is actually seeking godly offspring, kids, children, are a huge part of why God has set marriage up the way he has set marriage up. So now I want to kind of dial back and look at these four norms of marriage because not only do they benefit the spouses, not only do they describe the relationship between these two participants in marriage, but each of them have a very specific child benefit. And it's those child benefits that actually help us to weed out all the different versions of modern family that are presenting themselves to us today, very often in the name of progress or tolerance. So first, let's take these as we go, as scripture lays them out, complementarity, okay? So complementarity, the idea that these two different people in the relationship complement one another. There is a man and there is a woman. So what we see when we actually study, so we've got a couple decades of research when it comes to family structure. So there's a lot that we know about families, about what it takes for children to thrive. So that's what we're gonna talk about here. So one thing that matters when it comes to raising children is an, a male parent and a female parent. So a lot of the work that I do, you know, we talk about the importance of mothering and fathering, right? Some sociologists would say, there is no such thing as parenting. There is only mothering and there is fathering. So different are the ways that men and women interact with children there really is no such thing as parenting. Women mother, men father, and kids need both. Men cannot mother, women cannot father. They can't, right? So we look at, like in our book in, in chapter three, we talk a lot about gender, a lot about gender differences. Gender is not a social construct, right? Gender differences actually exist. And we talk in our book about how we know that gender is not a social construct. We know that there's these differences between male and female. And we begin by looking at the population that has no social influence at all, unborn babies, 
right? There's been no influence from the social world. And what we see in unborn baby, the brain scans of unborn babies is their brains are different. And they have had no exposure to the toxic patriarchy to tell them so, right? But then you can also look at another demographic, and that is the ones with massive social exposure. And so there's now been two or three huge studies done surveying outcomes for men and women when it comes to their career choices, educational choices, um, preferences around staying home with the kids. And what they see is societies that are the most egalitarian, the ones that offer women the most amount of educational choices, career options, opportunities to stay home if they want, actually produce the most stereotypically female and stereotypically male citizens, right? That when women have all the options in the world, they tend to choose careers that focus more on connecting with people. And men tend to choose careers that focus more on objects and things and ideas, right? In those cultures where women have as much choice as possible, as many opportunities as possible, those women choose to stay home with their kids when their kids are young and have flexible working hours until they hit about 18 years old. That's what women want, right? And so we actually see that these gender differences persist, whether you've got no exposure to society or massive exposure to society. So gender is not a social construct. And those differences actually, we would argue, are the most critical in the theater of child development, right? This is the place where gender differences matter the most. And so interesting because we can look at a variety of different institutions out there. Um, and people will acknowledge that gender matters in those institutions. So for example, a couple of years ago, um, California passed a, a law that said that there needed to be some female representation on the boards of every publicly held corporation. And why do you think they did that? Why did they say that women should be on the board? What do you think? Different perspectives, what? Equality, mm -hmm. what else? Why would that, why would that matter? Because they're different. Those differences, they, in their mind, right, the people who passed this law, those differences probably were going to improve, right, the functioning of the corporate uh, board. So they were like, well, gender matters, right? in that institution. And then interestingly, um, we have had certain candidates elevated to, for example, vice president or Supreme Court justice simply because they're a woman, right? Because somebody who's making the decision said that female perspective matters when it comes to the judiciary, when it comes to the executive branch. So what fascinates me is that there is one institution that gets the gender balance right 100% of the time. What institution is that? It's marriage. And yet that is the institution the left has relentlessly sought to destroy over the last couple decades. And I would argue that that is the institution where the gender balance matters most. So when we look at child development, that complementarity benefits children, especially when it comes to how men and women talk, how men and women discipline, how men and women play with kids, right? So we have a whole chapter on this. I'm gonna give you a very brief overview. Um, women tend to care for, what, when we look at the social science data, women tend to care for kids. Men tend to play with kids, okay? This is very true. So raise your hand if you recently have seen a baby thrown up in the air. Have you seen a baby thrown in the air? Raise your hand high if you've seen a baby thrown in the air. Keep your hand up if the person throwing the baby was the mom. Right, men throw babies. <laughs> women don't throw babies, okay? okay? Women women take the baby with these like 20 yard long pieces of fabric and they wrap the babies, right? They wear the babies, right? From morning to night, they just strap those babies onto them all the time. Women don't, we don't want our babies in the air. We want them right here, okay? Men want the babies in the air. And this is actually, critical to child development, right? There's something about that rough and tumble play that begins like well, they exit the wound, the baby's in the air. So, I mean, I don't know why, but there is something about this, this complementary way of mom focusing on the immediate emotional well-being of the child and dad constantly pushing the child's limits physically and emotionally and psychologically that seems to create a pretty fantastic balance. 
because moms tend to care for kids, a lot of the interaction that they have hones children's fine motor skills, right? So mom is doing activities with the kids where the baby or the child is cutting bananas with a knife, right? When mom's in the kitchen making dinner, tying shoes, coloring, cutting with scissors. Dad involvement has more to do with running, jumping, climbing, wrestling, and setting things on fire, okay? So dad involvement naturally maximizes children's gross motor skills, right? So you've got these two distinct complementary uh, adults involved, right? Maximizing child development in these two different ways. Another one that I think is just so fascinating is dads and moms talk to kids differently, right? Men naturally talk to babies the way they talk to everybody else, right? The ba they come home, the baby's kind of like, you know, running around with a little walker and the kid's like, man, I had a exhausting day. That presentation was murder. But of course, dad totally slayed and killed it, right? And mom says to the baby, mommy's so tired, she's pooped, right? So what you have is you've got one parent that naturally simplifies their language right down to the child's level. The kid understands everything the mom is saying. And you've got one parent that is constantly pushing the child's cognitive development by talking to them and using words that the kid's like, I have no idea what that means, right? But it's expanding their vocabulary. And so what we see is this complementarity benefits child development. So let's take a look at exclusivity. How does exclusivity benefit children. So when a relationship is exclusive, that means there's no outside adults involved in that relationship. If the relationship is exclusive, it will only be the child's own mother and own father in that relationship. Now, when it comes to safety and thriving, exclusivity is probably the number one value when it comes to children, okay? And there are exceptions to this rule, and I'm sure they're going to come up in the Q&A, and we can absolutely handle that. But when it comes to child safety, statistically, the place where the child is most likely to be safe and loved is in the home of their married biological mother and father. There are heroic step-parents out there. I know plenty of them. An unrelated man or unrelated woman who has stepped in to fill the gap of a negligent biological parent. And those people exist and they deserve our praise and our support. But when you look at society at large, unrelated adults do not benefit children the way their own biological parents do, right? When you have, there was a study done a couple of years ago in the UK that showed this very pronounced that children whose mother marries an unrelated man, those outcomes are about the same as the mother who raises the child as a single mother. But if the mother marries the child's biological father, the child can often catch up to their peers who are raised exclusively in an intact home, right? Children raised by a lone mother, they fare about as well as children raised by mother and stepfather. There are incredible, redeeming, wonderful step-parent situations, but statistically on the whole, they don't benefit children the same way. And what's worse, is very often an unrelated adult, especially an unrelated man, is statistically the most dangerous person in a child's life, okay? And um, you can fact check me, right? And for those of you, and you guys are doing great. None of you have your phones out, so get your phone out. Uh, or a few of you, the millennials will take me up on this. The Gen Zers got this, right? Get your phone out. Because um, if children just need to be safe and loved, if biology doesn't matter, if kids just need a mother and a father, then children who are being raised by their mother and her live-in boyfriend should be doing just great. Two incomes, a mother, a father figure, you know, any two will do, love makes a family. Um, so if you've got your phone out, which none of you do, like, what the heck? Um, get your phone out, and I want you to Google the words mother's boyfriend. Google mother's boyfriend for me. Um, this is exactly why, because biology matters when it comes to safety and thriving for children, this is exactly why adoptive parents like me, and probably like a lot of you guys, had to go through months or maybe years of screening and vetting and background checks and home studies and references and physical exams 
because social workers are not fools. They know that just because somebody wants a kid or intends to parent the kid, that does not mean they're going to treat the kid as if the child has been born to them. So raise your hand if you Googled mother's boyfriend. Give me a couple top hits, loud. Why are my mother's boyfriends so likely to kill? Why are mother's boyfriends so likely to kill? My daughter feels unsafe about her mom's boyfriend. My daughter feels unsafe about mother's boyfriend. Um, mother's boyfriend groom's daughter for a relationship. Mother's boyfriend groom's daughter for a relationship. What'd you get? Yeah, overrepresentation of abuse. Anybody else? 16 year old boy accused of killing mom's boyfriend on Father's Day. <laughs> that boy had enough. Yeah, what else? Why are mother's boyfriends so likely to kill? Mm -hmm. So, if you keep scrolling for thousands and thousands of pages, you're going to see the most horrific headlines of child abuse, child torture, and child filicide anywhere on the internet. Um, Brad Wilcox, who's one of the leading sociologists in the country says that the most dangerous place a child can find themselves in America is in the home of an unrelated cohabiting man, especially when he's left to care for the child alone. So when God says that this is to be exclusive, this is literally plan A for child protection. Number three, if this is going to be monogamous, right, this is going to create a one flesh union, one flesh, that special link to children. If we are, if this is monogamous, if this has a special link to children, that means the children are going to be linked to the two people to whom they have a natural right. So that's what we do at Them Before Us. We defend children's natural right to their own mother and father. Many of you are familiar with a child's right to life. You can use the same natural law reasoning to arrive at the conclusion that children have a natural right to their own mom and dad. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time on chapter one if you need a little more fleshing out on, on this concept, but you can take my word for it. Robert George wrote the foreword for my book and he's very solid. So um, take his word for it. So children are united. Marriage done God's way is going to unite the two people to whom children have a natural right. And it's going to do it permanently. It is going to do it for life, right? Let no man separate. And so that permanence matters because stability is critical to child thriving. In, in our work, we talk a lot about how there's three staples of a child's social emotional diet, three things that they need if they are going to thrive. There's all kinds of things, kind of supplemental nutrients that kids need. I would argue like an extended family, it's great to have some material resources, um, peer relationships, a good education. But if you do not have one of these three, most of these other things will not be able to compensate for it. What are those three things? Mother's love, father's love, and stability. You take out one of these three, it's going to be very hard for the child to thrive. And that's what the numbers tell us, right? So how do you get stability? Marriage. We literally, as a species, have not come up with a better recipe for giving children stability than marriage. And children don't just need stability. They don't just need the complementarity of mother and father. They don't just need the exclusivity of mom and dad. They don't just need um, the connection to the two people to whom they have a natural right. They don't just need that for two months or two years or 12 years. Kids need that stability all their life. We've, we've recently um, posted on our website um, a lot of quotes from children whose parents divorced when they were out of the house. It's, it's a new phenomenon called gray divorce, right, where people are getting divorced when they're 50 or 60 or 70. And it absolutely upends the life of these now adult children, right? That they are like, it destabilized me. I kind of feel like my whole life was a lie. Now I feel like I'm parenting my parents and I'm parenting my children all at once. That permanence matters to kids, and marriage is what gives it to them. So those are the four norms of marriage, right? Complementarity, exclusivity, monogamous, and permanent, okay? That is God's design for sex and marriage. It's going to have those four components to it. So now we're going to take a little look at different forms of modern family, because what modern family does is it will pull out one or more of those norms, and kids suffer as a result. So let's start with the definition, redefinition of marriage. 
And you're thinking, yeah, redefinition of marriage, gay marriage. But that was not the original redefinition of marriage. Legally, the first time that we tinkered with these four norms of marriage was not removing complementarity. It was removing permanence. It was when we passed no-fault divorce, right? First in California in 1969, and then finally New York somehow held out until 2010. Uh, New York of all places, right? So what happened when we removed permanence? So marriage historically has functioned as the most child-friendly institution the world has ever known, right? There was no other vehicle, there was no other institution that better predicted or safeguarded child thriving other than marriage. And it was because it had all four of these norms. So what happened when we removed permanence? Okay, it used to be before no fault divorce, there were reasons for divorce. I mean, even Jesus made some allowances for divorce in some cases. And in terms of civil law, most cultures and most countries have also made some provisions for people who were victims of abuse or adultery or abandonment or addiction. And then we would have something called at fault divorce. One spouse was guilty of breaking the, the marital vows, and then the courts and all of society could side with the innocent spouse and reward them with support or custody or the house um, or just you know emotional support. So what happened with no-fault divorce is we said, you know what, sometimes there's irreconcilable differences or the adults just aren't happy anymore. And so now we can have a divorce not because somebody is at fault, but because there's no fault. And what that communicated about the institution of marriage is marriage was no longer an institution with four norms centered around the thriving of children, but now marriage was just a vehicle for adult fulfillment. Now, if the adults in the marriage ceased to be happy, it could cease to be a marriage. And very often in practice, no fault divorce means unilateral divorce, divorce against somebody's will. And you probably have seen that in your life, a situation where maybe the, definitely the marriage wasn't perfect because I've yet to meet that marriage, but very often these no-fault divorces take place when one spouse is doing their best to keep it together, to raise the kids, to work through problems, and one spouse is acting like a child is irresponsible, wants to run off with the secretary or whatever it is. And the people who have to deal with the worst negative consequences is the spouse that's trying to do their best and hold it together. And then the kids suffer, right? Because the court cannot um, award fault, right? There, there's no punishment for breaking the, marriage, the marital vows. And so as a result, there's lifelong consequences, especially for the kids. So no-fault divorce rejects permanence. That's the norm that is rejected once we adopted the no-fault divorce model. So let's take a look at the impact on kids. So there are drastic physical health consequences, physical health consequences for children of divorce. Um, it's been linked to heart disease, diabetes, asthma. It doubles the likelihood that kids will have trouble with their gut with their skin, with their nervous system, with their genitals, with their urinary organs, right? Like this affects a child's whole body. There was actually one uh, study that was done, it came out in 2017, and it evaluated the impact of father loss on children's telomeres, the end caps of their chromosomes, largely responsible for longevity and health. And what it found is that children who lost their father to death, incarceration, or divorce, because that's what happens often after a divorce, is after two years, 40% of these kids never see their dad again. I mean, divorce often just means they lose a relationship with one parent, right? At best, they lose 50% of relationship with both parents. That's at best, right? They're starved of 50% of mother's love, 50% of father's love, and usually stability is totally gone. So it's no surprise that, so the, the telomeres study, it shortened the length of kids' telomeres for boys up to 
right? It has a cellular impact on a child's body when they lose their dad. And divorce is one of the ways that that happens. So it's no surprise that they are more susceptible to all of these long-term health issues. Mental health, right? For kids struggling with, who already have sort of mental health challenge, divorce poses an increased risk of reoccurring adult depression and a higher likelihood of developing bipolar disorder. There is something about starving a children of those three staples that impacts their mental health. Relational health, right? When there's a, there's a phrase that I use more and more these days, uh, John Colkin, Bible teacher from Dallas Theological Seminary maybe, um, who said the phrase, you become what you behold. You become what you behold. And I think this is very true in a theological sense. Like, why is it that we say, we sing, be thou my vision, O Lord of my, why is it that we look to the Lord? Um, and I think it's because he says, be holy as I am holy. We cannot become holy unless we are beholding that which is holy. So that's actually true in almost every area of our life, right? Whatever we are beholding, we become like that thing, whether or not we want to. You can see this in very damaging um, instances like pornography, right? It's very common to behold certain kinds of pornography and then to become that in your real life relationships. But it's also true in the positive sense. If your children behold you having a joyous, loving, intimate, playful, exclusive, faithful marriage, the likelihood that they are going to become that kind of husband or wife drastically increases, right? So children who behold their parents divorcing are much more likely to also become people whose marriage ends in divorce. Um, one study put that number at 45%, a 45% increase of kids divorcing if their own parents divorce. Very interesting. That number jumps to 91% if the divorced parents remarry. So remarriage to a new spouse does not redeem the marital picture for children. Somehow it further um, diminishes the likelihood that they're going to maintain their own healthy marriages. That's not to say all is lost by any means. My husband and I are both products of divorce and we were idiots when we got married. <laughs> like we didn't know how to have a healthy marriage. Every church that we went to for the first several years of our marriage had to literally disciple us and how to be married, because we had never beheld a healthy marriage, so we didn't know what to become. So we had to have people at church that we could behold and say, okay, that's what we want to become. Um, Elizabeth Margaret wrote a book in uh, 2013, I think, called Between Two Worlds, which studied a uh, long-term study of children of good divorces, right, not the bad divorce of, like, abuse adultery, abandonment, not that we're throwing plates at each other, high conflict marriage, but studied the children of good divorces. And what she found is that about half of the kids who lived in two different homes developed two different personalities, right? Because mom and dad had different religions. Mom and dad kept different secrets. They were different people, like different families on both sides. Sometimes these people over here barely even knew that these people existed. And I've seen this in our in our own world, um, both when I was growing up and now as an adult, kids of divorced homes, you know, when they come to your house from mom's house, they are saying a certain kind of thing. But when they come from dad's house, they say it totally. I mean, they have to become a different person in the drive between mom's house and dad's house, right? She's a Democrat. He's a Republican. She's a Buddhist. He's a Christian, right? And they have to play a different game. And I mean, especially when they're under 12, right? It's two different worlds that they live in. So no-fault divorce was the original redefinition of marriage. It rejected permanence. It, trans it, it was the first step of transforming this child-friendly institution into a vehicle of adult fulfillment. So then gay marriage said, okay, well, if marriage is just a vehicle of adult fulfillment, being married to another man or being married to another woman fulfills me, right? So gay marriage does away with the norm of complementarity, right? It doesn't need to be both halves of the human race. It can now be two men or two women. So this is bad for kids. 
um, to put it mildly. Um, and, and raise your hand if you've ever been in a conversation about gay marriage or gay parenting, um, where you're saying kids need, Hey, thanks, man. Way to go. 5,000 LCMS points to you. Way to go. Um, where you've said kids need moms and dads. Kids shouldn't be raised by two men or two women. Raise your hand if then somebody drops in a study there that says, oh yeah, well, 79 studies showed that children with two moms or two dads fare no different or even better. Have you ever seen that? Okay, yeah, so very, very common. So what's so fascinating to me about that is whenever sociologists are not studying gay parenting, they agree on three things, right? Number one, that men and women offer distinct and complementary benefits to children. When you're not talking about gay parenting, people are pretty honest about the differences between men and women and the importance of fathers and the importance of mothers or whatever. Number two, again, sociologists agree that unrelated adults don't interact with kids the way their own biological parents do. Unrelated adults are less invested, less connected, less protective of kids. They invest less time, they invest less money in kids than their own biological parents do. And we go into this in detail in chapter two of our book. And then third, whenever you're studying kids of divorce, those kids fare poorly. When you study kids who have lost a parent to death, those kids suffer, though not as much as kids of divorce, interestingly. When you study kids created through third-party reproduction, somebody else's sperm or somebody else's egg, they suffer diminished outcomes, right? Death, divorce, abandonment, ah. Oh. And then the kids who are abandoned and subsequently adopted do not fare as well, even though statistically adoptive parents spend more time and more money, are more highly educated, tend to have higher levels of wealth than the general population, and yet adopted kids still struggle more. So riddle me this, you know, pro same-sex marriage person, why is it that whenever you're not talking about same-sex parenting, gender matters, biology matters, and parental loss matters. And all three of those diminish child outcomes if they don't have them. And yet magically, when you study same-sex parenting, gender doesn't matter, biology doesn't matter, and child loss doesn't matter. How could that be? Such a mystery. Could it be because methodological flaws driven by political agenda influence how these studies were formulated and presented? Yes, that's exactly what it is, right? So the whole, uh, in chapter six of our book, the first half just examines the flaws in the no different studies. Methodologically, this is not, this is not the gold standard, right, of the scientific method that you learned in elementary or middle school, right? They tended to recruit their participants rather than find them at random or use government data. They used small samples that could not then be extrapolated like population-wide. Um, oftentimes, very, very often, they were not surveying the actual outcome of kids. They were asking the adults, do your kids like having two moms? They do? Great. Okay. So when you actually study the outcomes of kids, obviously we see that gender matters, biology matters, and that child loss impacts kids. So Paul Solens, I think, has done the best work on this. Former LCMS, now Catholic priest, he got to take his wife with him, which I thought smart for recruiting purposes, right? Uh, I love Paul Solens. He's at Catholic University of America, and he's, he and Mark Rignaris, I think, are doing the best work on family structure and are the bravest when it comes to family structure. So he actually um, compared survey, compared data using national health data, right? So he didn't collect the data, he was just assessing the data. So smart boy, smart boy, right? So nobody can assail his methods of data collection. And so this is what he found, comparisons, right? Same sex parented kids, opposite sex parented kids, okay? Emotional or behavioral difficulties, 9.3%. Same-sex parented, 4.4%. Opposite. Okay, so twice as many emotional and behavioral difficulties. No, th this is, should not be a surprise. Experienced definite or severe emotional problems. Same-sex parented, 14, almost 15% versus 5.5%. Almost threefold. Diagnosed with ADHD. 15.5%, 7.1%, almost twice as much. 
Learning disabilities, 14.1%, 8%. Special education and mental health services, 17.8%, 10.4%. Okay, so there is a, so when you actually use rigorous methods of evaluating different family structures, that no differences actually means gigantic difference. It means gigantic difference. And this shouldn't surprise us, right? This actually fits all of the things that we already know about family structure and what kids need and the importance of those three staples of a child's social emotional diet. Side, side note, Solon's, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, well that's because those kids didn't have the benefit of marriage. And I didn't write this down, but it's in our book. Paul Solon's actually studied outcomes between kids with same-sex cohabiting parents and same-sex married parents. And the kids with same-sex married parents fared worse than the ones whose same-sex parents were just living together. So marriage is not the solution if the marriage locks out one adult to whom children have a natural right. The kind of marriage that children need is not the one that meets adult emotional desires. It is the one that unites their mother and father for life. That is what kids need. Okay, 20,000 LCMS points for you. Way to go. So gay marriage rejects the complementarity that kids need that maximizes their development. And by the way, that satisfies their heart, right? We have something that we talk about a lot at Them Before Us, which is mother hunger and father hunger. Like kids don't just want to be loved in the abstract by whatever adults are in their world. They actually crave the love of a man and they crave the love of a woman. And you'll see this in kids who, for example, grow up without a dad. They will find a man to love them. Girls will find a man to love them. They will just find it when they are a 15 year old and there's some sleaze that says, I'll love you, honey, right? And that is why those girls 60 you know, 63% of them, um, you know, that are teen mothers didn't have a dad, right? Why is it that criminality is, why is it that father loss is almost a predictor of criminal behavior in boys? They will find a man to love them. They will find a gang that will bring them into the world of manhood, but they'll just do it to exploit them, right? Not because it's a man that has, that is the safest, most connected to, most invested in them, right? Kids don't need just, just need love in the abstract. They crave the love of man and they crave the love of a woman. All right, so what is the problem then with, because like, so we've, we redefined marriage in terms of removing permanence with no fault divorce. Gay marriage removed complementarity, okay? So you know what's on, next on the chopping block? Monogamy, right? Now polygamy is the next stop on this marriage redefinition train. Um, and all the same arguments that worked for gay marriage are gonna work for polygamy, right? If the adults are happy, the kids will be happy, right? Kids' bi biology doesn't matter, love makes a family, right? All of that is going to be applied and has been applied to the polygamy debate. I think there's three jurisdictions in Massachusetts that has already recognized in law some form of polygamous relationship. So it's coming. The problem with polygamy is it always includes unrelated adults in a child's living space, whether it's for one night or one lifetime. There's always going to be other men or other women in the child's home, and that always diminishes child outcomes. So there was a huge uh, survey of a lot of different studies put together called the the puzzle of monogamous marriage. Why is it that monogamous marriage is just so darn good for society? And specifically, why does polygamy diminish social outcomes? And there's a lot in there about the problem with you know, high status men having lots of women and then low status men having no women. And that is a sociological problem because women civilize men. And when men don't have women, they don't tend to be civilized, okay? So that's just how it is. And uh, you know, I, I heard somebody illustrate this one time and I was like, this is absolutely true. I, I live in Seattle. I live one block inside the Seattle city limits. I actually live in unincorporated King County in the place where housing prices are most affordable, which just means like you have to turn, you have to watch yourself when you walk, okay? And when I'm walking down the sidewalk, if I see a group of men, two men, four men walking towards me, just men, you know what I do? I cross the street. I'm not gonna walk past them. But if I see a group of two or three men walking hand in hand with their wives, you know what I do? I just keep walking, right? There's just some internal alarm in a woman's brain that goes, those men are okay. 
they have been civilized. Right. And uh, when men don't have women, they literally act like children a lot of the time. So anyway, there's a problem with polygamy just in terms of the adult population. But when it comes to the, ch the population of children, there is a huge problem with polygamy. I'll just read out their conclusion. Um, polygamous, polygamous marriages have an elevated risk of intra-household abuse, neglect, homicide, because households have lower average relatedness due to unrelated dyads. Translation, biology matters. Translation, if unrelated adults are sharing living spaces with children, there's more abuse, more neglect, and more homicide. Um, this is also true for stepmothers, right? And I, I say this knowing heroic stepmothers, and so do you, like we all know them. But when you look at population-wide evidence, um, stepmothers are 2.4 times more likely to kill their stepchildren than birth mothers. Children li living with an unrelated parent are between 15 and 77 times, not percent, times more likely to die accidentally. So there's just some level of connectedness and supervision that biology affords. And there's actually um, a term that captures all of this, this horrible reality, and it's called the Cinderella effect. And you can look that up if you want. Oh, do you get some loose LCMS points here? Yeah, how many points do you deserve? Did you know that? He said right before you. <gasps> 10,000 points. Good job. Well done. Yeah, and this is not a Christian phrase. Like We look at this and we go, okay, that's in nature. Um, but evolutionary biologists look at this and they say, oh, well, this makes sense. Because why would somebody invest in offspring that are not going to carry on their lineage or their genes, right? So from an evolutionary perspective, there's no advantage to investing in unrelated offspring. And that's what they've seen, right, with these increased rates of abuse and neglect. Less money spent on food, less number of visits to the doctor. Unrelated adults just don't buckle the car seats of the kids as often as their own biological parents do. Um, so polygamy rejects the norm of monogamy. It always includes unrelated adults. Uh, open marriage, right? That's a new big progressive trend. If you're a subscriber to the New York Times, a couple times a month, they're promoting the benefits of open marriage or consensual non-monogamy or however they want to put that. Uh, what's the problem with that? Same thing as polygamy. <laughs> It's always going to be unrelated adults sharing living spaces with kids. It's always going to diminish child outcomes. And by the way, um, it does not provide a sense of security and safety for kids. Um, I was talking one time with Pat Fagan, who is runs um, a research organization called Mary.us. It's just a clearinghouse for incredible data on marriage and mothers and fathers. But he also did family therapy for 50 years. Um, family counseling, child therapy. And he said, when a child sees their mother loving their father, they feel like their mother is loving them. When they see their father loving their mother, they feel like their father is loving them. Nobody has to be touching the kid or even looking at the kid, but the kid feels like they're being loved through that interaction. And in his opinion, it's the only example in the human experience where you can be loved indirectly. That does not tend to be the case when a child sees mom loving her boyfriend, right? The 16-year-old might kill the boyfriend, right? Because those feelings, it does not tend to engender a feeling of security and love. It usually results in competition and jealousy. Get your hands off my mom, right? It's not safety and security. Um, and that, you know, we have a couple stories of kids in our book who were raised in these polygamous homes, and that's how they feel. They don't love it when they see their dad showing physical affection to another woman in the living room when their mom walked out. They tend to feel like, I hate that, right? Uh, open marriage rejects exclusivity. Uh, cohabitation, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about reproductive technologies and same-sex parenting because that's kind of in the news. But by the numbers... Cohabitation is the greatest threat to children's rights today. What is the problem with cohabitation? It rejects permanence. 
Cohabiting unions are very seldom permanent unions. On average, cohabiting unions last about 18 months, which is about as long as that chemical in love feeling lasts, right? And when that wears off and you suddenly go, wait a second, I don't love that he plays video games for six hours a day. That just that kind of bugs me, right? Before that 18 month period, he's like, oh my gosh, he's just the best. I just love him. He pays it. But after that chemical high wears off, you start, you start to see all the things you don't like in that person, right? And then usually if it's a cohabiting relationship, it ends right there. Now, that's a problem for kids, right? Because they need their parents together. A lot of those cohabiting unions are going to produce children because they have a special link to kids. They have that complementary one fleshness taking place just without the permanence that kids need. So kids in cohabiting relationships are three times more likely to see their parents break up four times more likely to suffer, suffer physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, four times more likely to live in poverty, more likely to use drugs, to have depression, drop out of school. Um, there's something about that permanence that kids need, and marriage gives it to them. Cohabitation doesn't. And, of course, the problem with cohabitation is very rarely that a kid only has one cohabiting relationship. Usually they're born into a cohabiting relationship that breaks up, Mom and dad, mom repartners over here, dad repartners over here. That lasts 18 months. Some new children might arrive with that. Some might be born to it. Those are more likely to break up. And then oftentimes in both spheres, the kid will just experience instability, right? On both halves of their household, their now split household, if they stay connected to both parents, which is pretty hard to do without marriage. Quickly, third-party reproduction. Um, what is third-party reproduction in the technical world? What does that do? It rejects the importance of biology, right? In essence, this is intentionally severing a relationship with a biological parent at the moment of conception. These kids struggle. Um, what is it? One thing that biology does other than ensuring, not ensuring, but stacking the deck in favor of children's safety and thriving is it grants something to kids that no other adult can give them. Only a child's own mother and father grant them something that they crave, and that is their biological identity. It is very hard to answer the question, who am I? If a child can't answer the question, whose am I? Okay, And that is what we see from kids created through third-party reproduction. Um, one large survey found that 64% of donor-conceived adults believe that their sperm donor is half of who they are, because he is, right? He literally contributed 50% of their genetics. 70% um, believe they've been harmed by anonymous donation. 89% believe it's important to know the identity of their donor, that it's a human right to know both halves of your existence. And side note, this is actually why adoption has undergone a massive transformation since the 50s and 60s when it overwhelmingly used to be closed adoption, right? Some of you guys that maybe were around back then, you remember that a lot of the times adoptive parents were told it doesn't matter. The kid's better off with you than the single mom who's probably poor. Now they're going to have a mom and dad and a stable marriage who are well off and they're probably Christians. They don't even need to know they were adopted. And yet, overwhelmingly, kids struggle. And that actually, that phase of closed adoptions is when we first identified and coined the phrase identity crisis, because these kids struggled to answer the question, who am I? And that's exactly why now in the United States, 95% of adoptions are open adoptions, because social workers recognize that kids benefit from as many connections as possible to their first family, even if they can't be raised by them. So third-party reproduction rejects biology. Surrogacy, this is going to be really fast. Surrogacy rejects motherhood. And unfortunately, there is too much moral confusion about surrogacy in the Christian world, in the conservative world. So let me just break this down as simply as I can. What surrogacy does is it splices what should be one woman, mother, into three purchasable and optional women. Okay, those three women are the genetic mother, the one who contributes the egg, 
gives the child their biological identity, the birth mother that forms that critical maternal bond that sets the foundation for trust and attachment throughout the rest of the child's life. When you sever this bond, it is what adoptees have long called a primal wound, right? The thing that made it more difficult for them to trust and attach. Perhaps the reason why adoptees have more externalizing disorders, because in essence, they had to start from scratch the day they were born, rather than continue that fulfilled bond that they already began with the woman, the only person they knew on the day that they were born. And then the social mother, the woman who offers that feminine love, that feminine, those simplified languages, that fine motor skill development, the one that's caring for instead of playing with, right? So when it comes to the child, none of these three women are optional. The kid needs the genetic mother, the birth mother, and the social mother. When these women are not found in the same person, the child experiences loss. But surrogacy in essence says kind of a la carte style. Which mom do you need? Which mom do you not have? Which one do you need to rent? Which one do you need to pay for? Which one are you just going to disregard altogether? Surrogacy always insists that adults sacrifice, that children sacrifice something that they need so an adult can have something that they want. There is no situation where surrogacy is a child-friendly process. And that's hard because all of us know and love people who struggle with infertility and desperately want to be parents and would be incredible mothers and fathers. But for a group of people who are charged with defending the least of these, surrogacy is always a no. It's always a no. And then finally, uh, adoption. Adoption is the great exception in all of this. And I'll tell you why. Um, there is something that all of these other alternative family forms have in common, whether it's no-fault divorce, same-sex parenting, third-party reproduction, polygamy, open marriage, cohabitation. All of them insist that the child sacrifice something they have a natural right to or something that they need, either their mother's love, their father's love, or stability, so that an adult can live as they please. All of them elevate adult desire above children's rights and well-being. All of them insist that children do hard things on behalf of adults. Adoption is the exact opposite. Adoption is adults doing hard things on behalf of children. Adoption is adults taking on a burden for a child that has lost their parents, right? In adoption, the goal is not to get every adult who wants a kid a kid. In adoption, the child is the client. The goal is to give the children a loving home and the adults are the ones that have to do the hard things, right? And we, can't, we spend quite a bit of time in our work and in our book contrasting adoption and third-party reproduction. Right? If adoption is done well, every child that needs parents is going to be placed in a loving home, but not every adult that wants a kid is going to get one. In third-party reproduction, every adult that wants a kid is going to get a kid regardless of the cost to that child. There's no screening. There's no background checks. There's no vetting. We already have situations where people have procured children through third-party reproduction who never would have passed a background check, who created these children specifically for exploitation. Okay. In the world of children's rights, third-party reproduction is a marketplace centered around the desires of adults. Adoption is an institution centered around the well-being of children. Okay? So you'll see that the, the line that runs through all of these different issues really is insisting. What is the child-centric approach to all these problems? Because these are big issues. They're big problems. The solution is simple and hard. And it is simply that adults will do hard things for kids. That's it. And that's, it's very, very hard. So what does that mean? That means that adults who are in a struggling marriage, which is most marriages at some point, right? I've been married 25 years. We had a rough, 2017, 2018, rough, very rough, right? I'm not gonna pretend that this is just a cakewalk. Um, every marriage is going to encounter the, the sickness, the worse, the poorer of the marital vows, right? And those pressures 
pull at you, right? And it's very easy to think, not that we did, but it's very easy to think divorce is the escape, okay? But if the parents fail to do the hard thing in the struggling marriage, right? And it's hard. In essence, what they're saying is, this cross is too heavy for me. Here, kid, you take it instead. Adults have to do the hard thing in that marriage situation to spare children the lifelong hardship of split homes and split lives. I think all of us know incredible men or women who are single and don't want to be, who desperately want to be married, who have lived faithfully, waiting for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, and they are still waiting. Someone is going to do the hard thing in that situation, especially, you know, I know women close to 40, past 40, who see that window of motherhood closing through no fault of their own and desperately want a baby and have considered going to get a sperm donor so they can be the mother that they desperately want to be. Someone is going to do the hard thing in that situation. It is either going to be the woman who will figure out a way to channel her maternal longings into a into a child-centric world in a child-centric way, or it will be the child who will then deal with the father hunger and the father loss that will diminish their outcomes for life. So who, someone's gonna do the hard thing in that situation. Or, you know, it's the, it's the unplanned pregnancy. Someone is gonna do the hard thing there. I mean, like unplanned pregnancies, some of those are pretty terrifying. Age, maybe a, disabil a diagnosed disability. Someone is gonna do the hard thing is it going to be the mother and father who reorient their lives around each other and around the baby? Or is it going to be, be the baby who has to lose their right to life or not grow up with a married mom and dad? Someone will do hard things. It will be the adults or it will be the child. For our brothers and sisters who experience same-sex attraction, who would many of these men and women would be incredible mothers and incredible fathers, if they choose to form a family around their attractions rather than children's natural right, that child is going to be saddled with mother hunger or father hunger, the disadvantage of losing a biological parent, the disadvantage of living with an unrelated adult. Someone is going to do the hard thing. Will it be the adults who orient their family around a child's right, or will it be the child who has to lose their rights to fit into that romantic arrangement? Who will do it? Will it be the adults or the kids? What about our friends who struggle with infertility? Which, let me just say, I, I mean, I have not dealt with this personally, but my friends who have, describe it as the worst breakup they've ever experienced month after month after month after month after month, and they can't think about anything else, right? It is so consuming for them. They deserve our empathy, they deserve our support, but if the solution to infertility is to violate a child's right to their mother and father, if their desire to have a biological connection to a child somehow overrides the child's right to have a relationship with their biological parent, someone is going to do the hard thing. Is it going to be the adults or is it going to be the child? And for those of us who have a strong, healthy marriage, who don't have problems with fertility, who know that there are children in foster care or know that there are children languishing in an orphanage overseas and know that we could do the hard thing by bringing them into our home. Who's gonna do the hard thing? And it is hard, right? We adopted a special needs child who is an amazing kid. It was very hard, but who's gonna do the hard things? My husband and I and our kids, by bringing a child into our home that doesn't have a family, or our son, who lives a fatherless and motherless existence and all of the health risks and social risks that would go along with not being folded into a family. Someone's gonna do the hard thing. So in the world of children's rights, the answer is adults do hard things. That is how a just society operates. A just society does not force the weak to sacrifice for the strong. A just society insists that the strong sacrifice for the weak. 
and that needs to first and primarily happen in matters of marriage and family. Because when you do not secure individual thriving for children, we will never have social thriving. Nailed it, Gregory.